Shall we turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians? Book of Ephesians in chapter 3. And we'll read beginning with verse 7 tonight, down through verse 9. We'll do that uh, because it's been four weeks today <laughs> since we was last in this study. Um, verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister. Whereof refers to the mystery that he's talking about. And he was made a minister of that mystery. According to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the verse we'll be dealing with tonight and maybe finishing up tonight, don't think we'll get into verse 10, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Paul was, said he was made a minister. A minister of the mystery, as is the subject of the text. Yes, we know him to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But as he's speaking here, he was a minister of the gospel, but he was also a minister of this mystery. And he says that it was according to the gift of the grace of God given. <laughs> Salvation is a gift. Amen. But also, it is a gift given to be a minister of the gospel, a minister of the word, as Paul says, a minister of the mystery, and it is grace that is needed for the performing of all tasks that are given unto us as members of the Lord's church. And that is given, those various gifts are given as he expresses to the Corinthians in the 12th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And he says that it was made effectual. It was by the effectual working power of the Lord. Just as in salvation, it was the effectual working power of God to bring salvation to us, to regenerate us. So it is the effectual working of his power affecting the gifts that he wants in the individual members of his church. And in this case, Paul, the minister of this mystery. In verse 8, Paul considered himself to be less than the least of all saints. And you should remember our thoughts and discussion on that. Not the least of all saints, but less than the least of all saints. And, and I believe that's a heart that is 
expressive of everyone, should be, of everyone who's been born again. They, they don't see any, any good in themselves whatsoever. In fact, I, I remember the day of my salvation just as plain today as if it happened today. And, and, and I, I, was, I was a scoundrel. I was a wretch. And uh, still, still am. Uh, the more that I grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the more I see my wretchedness. Thank God for his unspeakable gift which he's given to me. The last time we was in this, we took the thought from verse 8 that he was to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now in a couple of weeks, I think a couple of weeks, this should be made real clear to us, even more so the unsearchable riches of Christ. And yes, salvation, redemption that is in and through him certainly is some of, a part of those unsearchable riches that are in Christ. But certainly there's a lot more. And thus it is termed unsearchable. <laughs> it's, it's past our comprehension. It's past our finding out all of those unsearchable. Paul's heart certainly overflowed with joy. Being apostle to the Gentiles and uh, along with it revealing the mystery of Christ which was hid in God, as our verse says, before the foundation of the world. John the Baptist was the proclaimer of Christ, was the forerunner to Christ, to the Jews, and he prepared a people. He preached repentance and faith and baptized those who show forth evidence of repentance. Certainly those riches in Christ are, as we've already mentioned, unsearchable. The riches of Christ are certainly riches of his grace, of his mercy. They're unspeakable. They're unfathomable. They're inexplorable. They can't be charted out on a chart. Sometimes I get to feeling ashamed. I'm sitting, I'm think, thinking of the blessings of the Lord. And let me name them. We, we have a song, Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. See what God has done. And I'll start naming. And I feel so, so ashamed that I can't can't bring up more of his marvelous blessings to us. And certainly we have to think of in keeping with the context of our scripture, unsearchable riches of Christ as being wrapped up in his church that prized possession, that jewel, that, that, that 
pearl of great price that he came and he found and bought a field and hid it in that field and redeemed it unto himself. It brings us to our point tonight. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. This word fellowship has uh, somewhat of a problem with it. It is a Greek word which expresses fellowship, it expresses communion, it ex expresses a joint participation, a joint partnership. And here's where the problem lies in because a great number of the older manuscripts which is which have been adopted by many reliable commentaries say it should be a different Greek word the pro here, herein lies the problem the two Greek words are very similar in spelling. But they are different in meaning. And I'm inclined to go along with, with that, that, that it is the other Greek word that it should have been because that's more in keeping with the context that we have here, and that Greek word is translated in this text. Verse 2 is dispensation. And it means administration. It means stewardship. And so therefore I, I take this view along with some of them others in the, some of the older manuscripts say that in the recording of manuscripts the, the, just the slightest little change in spelling occurred. Not going to make it a big issue because whether you take it to mean participation at communion or administration, stewardship, <laughs> they both work. But in keeping with the context, he, let's read verse 2 of this third chapter. He said, Have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, the administration, the stewardship, the management of the household of grace, of the grace of God, which is given to me you to your word. And so then in verse 9 he says, fellowship, he talks about partnership. No, I think he's continuing to talk about this dispensation that has been given to him, this administration that has been given to him, the management of this mystery. You see, 
Turn with me to the book of Colossians in chapter 1, where we have this word dispensation again occurring, and again in one of Paul's writings, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in verse 25, he says, In having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your... I'm in Philippians. You guys wondered where I was, didn't you? Colossians chapter 1. Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister... See, it sounds very similar to what we've been looking at in Ephesians chapter 3. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. You see how it easily could have been down through the years as the transcripts are, are recorded and, can, and copied, it could have very easily been an error in copying it over. Because Paul's talking the same thing to the Colossians, and he uses the Greek word, and in the verse, the verse preceding in our text, he uses the Greek word for administration, management, stewardship. And so I think that's what's intended here. But whether it was partnership or management, stewardship, it'll fit. But consider this. We have the tabernacle. We have the temple. And now we have the church. The tabernacle had its administrator, its manager, the one who was to oversee it. The temple had its administrator, its manager, its steward, the one who was over it, the one who was to see to it. And the church was given an administrator, a steward, <laughs> a manager. God gave to Moses the plans for the tabernacle. And he was to see to it as an administrator that everything was made according to the pattern that was given to him by God. We're going to take some time and look at that. Turn with me back to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus in chapter 24. And look at verse 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and gathered him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, 
and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now look at verse 40. And he continues with the instructions to Moses. In verse 40 it says, And look and see to it that thou make them after their pattern which was showed to thee in the mount. God here is instructing Moses, you're going to be the administrator of this. Here's the pattern. Here's the instructions for everything concerning the tabernacle. And he says now in verse 40, now he says, and you see to it. And you make sure that it's made according to the pattern that I gave you in the mount. Look with me at the 26th chapter and verse 30 and we have in the 26th chapter some more instruction and verse 30 says and thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof according to the pattern according to that which was communicated to you which was showed thee in the mount <laughs> You see Moses as an administrator of that, administering, managing the building of the tabernacle. Now turn with me to the book of Numbers, chapter 8. Numbers, chapter 8. And this is concerning another instrument. In verse 4 it says, And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold, unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work, according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses, so he made the candlestick. Moses was responsible for overseeing it. He had the pattern. He, it had been given to him. He had the instructions for it. And he was to oversee to the work and to see to it that it was made exactly according to the pattern. No fudging here. No fudging there like we are so happy to do today. To ease and appease men's feelings and consciences. And we've strayed from the pattern. Oh, that's another subject. Isn't it? That's the church. Isn't it? Well, let's continue on. So God gave to Moses the plans for the tab tabernacle. Moses was the administrator. The temple. God gave to David the pattern for the temple. Anybody know why God gave the pattern for the temple to David? Well, David had it in his heart to build a house for the Lord. A house for the Ark of Covenant and a meeting place for the Lord. But God said, no. You're a man of blood. You have blood on your hands. You've shed blood. But he said, you can gather the materials for the temple and for all that was to go in the temple. How was David going to know what to gather? The Lord had to give him the pattern, didn't he? And from the pattern, David knew what to gather, what to prepare for the temple. So God gave to David the plans for the temple. He wasn't allowed to build it, to assemble it. But he could only gather together the materials. 
and his son, Solomon, who was to succeed him, would be permitted to build the temple. And so David gave to Solomon, his son, when his son succeeded him, was made king, he gave to Solomon the pattern for the temple. Turn with me to the book of First Chronicles. The book of First Chronicles. In chapter 28. And we're going to begin reading with verse 9 here. Solomon has been made king. And David here is kind of given his closing in this chapter. And he exhorts the people to, to fear God and to follow their king, Solomon. And to Solomon he says in verse 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the house thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things also for the courses of the priest and the Levites and for all the work of the servants of the house of the Lord and for all the vessels of service in the house of the Lord. He gave of gold by weight for things of gold, for all instruments, for all manner of service, silver, and for all instruments of silver by weight, for all instruments of every kind of service, even the weight for the candlestick of gold and for the lamps of gold by weight for every candlestick and for the lamps thereof and for the candlesticks of silver by weight both by uh, for the candlestick and also for the lamps thereof according to the use of every candlestick and by weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread for every table and likewise silver for the tables of silver also pure gold for the flesh hooks and the bowls and the cups and for the golden uh, basins he gave gold by weight for every basin and likewise silver by weight for every basin of silver and for the altar of incense refined gold by weight and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims and uh, that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And behold, the courses of the priests and of the Levites, even they shall be with thee, 
for all the service of the house of God, and there shall be with thee for all manner of workmanship, every willing, skillful man, for any manner of service, also the princes and all the people will be holy at thy commandment. So here we have it. God gave to David the patterns for the temple and, and all the materials that were to go in it. David assembled them together when Solomon, his son, was made king in his place because he was about to pass off the scene. He gave the pattern and the materials that were assembled unto Solomon, just as God had instructed him, and he instructs Solomon, see to it, do it, <laughs> do it according to the patterns that I've given unto you, which were given to me by God, and thus you'll be, be fulfilling the work of God according to his commands. Solomon then becomes the administrator of the temple. He was the overseer. He was given the oversight. He was given the position of manager, seeing to it that everything that was built in the temple was according to the pattern, and everything that went into the temple, into the temple was according to the pattern. Eat right down to the priest and the Levites and all of their dress and ornaments that they were to have. Now, when God called Paul up into the third heaven, he gave him the secret of the church. You see, the Old Testament saints didn't see the church. As someone has like, likened it, two mountaintops, and there's a valley in between, and they didn't see the church here. And I'll say this. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the church is the most glorious of the three. Israel, in all her glory, disobedient, rebellion, was set aside, not cast off, just set aside for a time. You're going to hear this again. I said I was getting ahead of myself. It was cast off, it was not cast off, it was just set aside for a time. That time is drawing near to a close. <laughs> Israel is going to be assembled together. God is, is going to reveal himself to her. There is an elect people of the nation of Israel to be saved. And Israel shall realize a glory that they have never realized before. But it will pale to the glory of the church in the eternal ages. For the bride... And I'll go ahead and say it now. Which is not every regenerated individual. It is not even every regenerated, scripturally baptized member of the Lord's church. It is given to the faithful of the church to be the bride. That coveted position the Lamb's wife, the Lamb's bride, and to be seated on the right-hand side of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There, I went ahead, delivered to you 
part of a message from that's going to be two or three weeks down the road. <clears throat> so when God called Paul up into the third heaven, he gave him the secret of the church. And he was made the administrator, the manager. He was responsible for the proper arrangement of the church. That's why we have so much recorded of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys and his establishing of churches, ordaining elders before he left them. He stayed in an area a year and a half, three years, teaching and instructing them He was responsible to see to the proper arrangement of God's organization, God's assembly. And thus, we have so many of the epistles that are church epistles. They were written to churches and they were written to pastors of churches. Do you ever wonder why Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament? And the majority of them are church epistles written to churches and to pastors? That's why, because he was the administrator. He had, he had the truth from, from Jesus Christ's own mouth. of the church of Jesus Christ. And as well as the other apostles and prophets. But none like unto the apostle Paul. We have to say the other apostles and prophets because he references them in verse 5 of chapter 3. He said, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So yes, the other apostles did have some, some enlightenment into church truth and, and the arrangement of the church. Church. And they imparted it where they went, but it was Paul's primary ministry, we see. Now, in our verse 9, it said to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Notice the word men. Notice that it is italicized. So we could leave it out. Meaning it's italicized because it wasn't in the original text. It was something added by the King James translators just as a way of clarification. And it would be if it was there by in the original manuscript, it would be, we know it would be in the generic form, meaning not man as man, but meaning mankind, which gets men and women included in the mix. Well, there's another discrepancy comes into view. I hate sharing all this with you. It's, I'm not trying to tear down the King James. I'm really not. 
But I just want you to be aware of this if, if you ever happen to read commentators and so forth on the passage. The word all. We could read this, the sentence then leaving men out. We could read to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Well, let me ask the question right off the start. Is Paul saying that was his mission? That that was the ministry that he was given? To make all see. Some reject the word all, saying it was never in the original manuscripts. Those are supposed to be better Greek authorities. I quote, better Greek authorities. Some limit the scope to only to the Gentiles. They say, well, all refers to all Gentiles. Well, it could. But is that what Paul is saying? Remember, in the book of Ephesians, and particularly the second chapter and then into the third chapter, and he's going to show us more into the third chapter here, Jew and Gentile brought together in the same body of Christ. Now that we can follow Paul's example, the example of his life. What was, what was Paul's purpose? What was Paul's aim? We say he was made a minister to the Gentiles, and yes, and that, that is very obvious. But he went to the Jewish Jews first. He even says the gospel is to the Jew first, to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. We he turned in one place in, in the 13th chapter of Acts. He turned from the Jews because they were rejecting the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, they were rejecting it and he turned unto the Gentiles who were eager to hear the gospel. We follow him in his missionary journeys which were into Gentile regions, but in every region that he went, he found the Jewish synagogue first, and he went in there and began to proclaim Jesus Christ, and then went to the Gentiles and proclaimed Jesus Christ. So I believe Paul's purpose and intent was to all... <laughs> He de for he declared to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And then even towards the end of his ministry as you, as you follow it there in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, his conversation with the Ephesian elders. And he's going to leave there and he must go to Jerusalem not knowing what might befall him. Another chapter or two later, he's going to, he's, he's making, he's been on a ship and he started sail and he's gone to one area and, and, and the Christians come in there and they warn him, listen, they're waiting for you at Jerusalem to kill you, to take you captive. 
that do you harm. Don't go there. Paul said, I must go. He says, I don't care what happens to me. He says, I'm, I'm ready to die at Jerusalem. And he went to Jerusalem against all the warnings otherwise. Well, we got to quit there. We're out of time tonight. We didn't get verse 9 completely finished. Well, that's all right. We'll finish it up next week, Lord willing, and, and get started in verse 10 then. Well, I don't know about you. I think this is some good, good stuff here in the third chapter of the book of Ephesians. Shall we um, dismiss from this service with a word of prayer?